Okay, excuse me if you don't mind, I use my tambourine again. Yeah. Now this morning we're a lovely small group, not like yesterday, so I would like to get some feedback about this. Any, anybody say which of these resonated for them and why? A teacher is like, what occurred to you? All the answers are right, of course, but it would just be interesting to hear your views. Don't be shy. Yes, yes. Who said that? A gardener. Why did you, why did you think that? Why did you think that? Who said gardener? Okay, come on. Why a gardener? We water the plants. Yes. Absolutely <laughs> lovely. Okay. Isn't that fantastic? Yes. What a lovely metaphor. Absolutely. And indeed, any of you who know um, Lynn Cameron's book on teaching young learners, that is a metaphor that she uses for vocabulary development and how actually when we're teaching children vocabulary, we need to constantly provide ever-expanding circles of um, meaning and use of vocabulary. So that's a wonderful one, absolutely. Any other ideas? Oh, yes, okay. Can you tell us why? Uh, someone told me I am theatrical. Okay. And I am teaching. Right. So I think that speaks about me more. Okay, and how do, how do you think that helps you in your teaching? Uh, yeah, facial expression, and then I show, I mean, I show my, my, my zeal, I'm, as, I'm enthusiastic, and that will affect, influence my students into, my, into learning my lessons. Absolutely wonderful. Could you hear that at the back? Okay, fantastic. Any other things that you thought of? A doctor. A doctor. Because uh, as a doctor, we need to, uh, we need to heal the sick, the, our people's sicknesses. Eh? Not like to be, you give the pills, but you try to find out what kind of the best solution for your people when they have uh, any problems. Okay, so the okay. doctor works like that, try to find out that. Absolutely, and we like preventive health, yeah, don't we? Yeah. Preventive and medicine. Then, <laughs> okay, fantastic. Any other things? I heard one from you. You were very close to me. You were talking about being a policeman. <laughs> <laughs> being a policeman. You've got a sort of. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, but a policeman, that, that's a very typical one, isn't it? And I think it happens to all of us. Why do we sometimes think that? Discipline. Discipline problems. Okay, okay. Any others that occurred to you? A football coach. Okay, can you tell us why? We guide our pupils to shoot at the goals for their lives. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, fantastic, fantastic. And we also have to teach them how to dribble, how to practice, how to get all those skills. Absolutely, absolutely. And I did hear actually somewhere over here, somebody mentioned a cook. And that is a very powerful metaphor as well, that we are like cooks cooking up recipes for our lessons and our units of work and adding just the right spices that our children need. And actually that's something I use quite often when I'm on training courses and helping teachers to think about planning their lessons and the kind of ingredients that they need. So it's interesting, isn't it? And I think actually metaphors help us to explore not only our role as teacher, but also issues and problems. And actually, for, for me, when I look at that list, although, of course, all of them are right answers, the one that resonates immediately for me is the one that was mentioned here, which is to do with the acting side of things. And I think of this both because, as teachers, whenever we go into class, Monday morning, we're feeling tired, perhaps we've got flu, we've got a cold, perhaps we had an argument with our loved ones just before, <laughs> just before we left the house. But the minute to go in, we go into class, we put on our professional persona, okay? And we are the unchanging face of the teacher. So that in one way, and in the other way, very much the way uh, I'd like to pick up on what you said here, the way that we actually, when we're working with children, we use 
our expressions, our body language, our acting skills, to convey meaning all the time and to um, engage our children. In fact, I have to say, my family, after years and years of me being a teacher, and I kind of seem to do it without, it's part of my, you know, I say, would you like to go for a swim? <laughs> and uh, use those kind of gestures all the time in the way that we do with young people. So it seems to me that um, actually acting is an integral part of what we do, although remembering that we all have different personalities and personas, and we should never do in the classroom anything that feels unnatural to us, because the children will pick it up and they will know that you're feeling uncomfortable straight away. So we all have our own kind of personas and the way we do it is different. But in terms of our topic for this morning, story and drama, these seem to me to go together in our classroom a bit like in a British context, you know, fish and chips or sun and moon. That's not British context, of course. And they collocate um, together. And what I would like to do now is to just have a very quick look at seven shared features of story and drama. And I should say straight away, you don't need to write any of this down because I will be giving you a handout at the end with all these slides also so that you have the pictures of some of the things that we'll be doing later. Okay, so to start off then, uh, shared features of story and drama, they build on children's capacity for play. This little boy here in a Lego box is actually in a pirate ship in the middle of the ocean, okay? <laughs> children have a huge capacity for imagination, possibility, and pretend play. And story and drama build on that capacity for imagination, for possibility um, thinking, and enable children to construct meaning from everything in the environment around them. My next shared feature here, oh, the quality is a little bit dark this morning. Something's changed. Anyway, I'm not going to touch it, but never mind. I hope you can see clearly enough. They deal with issues of human significance. Now, we know the kind of issues that are significant for young children. Things about not wanting to go to bed at bedtime, about being scared of the dark, about being worried about making friends, maybe, about not wanting to eat particular kinds of food, cabbage and broccoli, certainly in an English context, what children traditionally hate, and their parents and carers are constantly getting them to eat. So, and as Bruna has said, and I mentioned him the other morning, uh, we shape our lives and identities through stories. And actually, stories allow us to deal with these issues of human significance at a safe distance. Because we're not talking about ourselves and our own immediate personal preoccupations. We're talking about um, a fictional character. And so stories and drama allow us to deal with things that are important and relevant and therefore memorable in terms of learning, but in a very um, safe kind of way. My next point here is that they engage multiple intelligences. Now, I'm sure a lot of you here are familiar with Howard Gardner's work on multiple intelligences, originally published in the early 1980s. And I would just like to say very strongly that I do not... Uh, mention Howard Gardner's proposal in terms of a theory of mind, because it has been um, very criticized for that. I'm not going to go into that here. But what I do think is useful for us as teachers, as practitioners, um, is that um, Howard Gardner's intelligences, all the ones around here, verbal, linguistic, musical, kinesthetic, visual, spatial, etc. I'm sure you're familiar with this give us actually a pedagogical framework for making sure that in our classes, when we have 30, 35, 40, 90, or only five, it doesn't matter, every child has a unique intelligence profile. And Howard Gardner's uh, multiple intelligences enable us to plan our lessons in order to, as I like to say, reach and teach all our children. And story and drama provide an ideal springboard for us to be able to engage children's multiple intelligences 
and allow them to build on their own personal strengths for learning. Okay, my next point here related is that they appeal to very different learning styles. Okay, the typical learning styles, visual, which I understand from talking to some of the mentors and teachers during this, contact, uh, during this conference, the Malaysian children have a very visual uh, learning style. So visual, some learners are very visual. Others are more auditory. They want to hear things, say it over again in their head. Others are more kinesthetic. And another kind of learning style that is also identified is a reading, writing one. And I think we all know the children in our class who feel kind of secure when they actually see it um, written down. And of course, what we're doing, ch young children, their learning styles are just emerging. And so actually, story and drama provide us with a context which allows children to develop um, their personal learning styles. The next point here, they suspend norms of place, time, and identity. When we're all in our classroom together, listening to a story or doing a drama activity, we transpose the classroom into a jungle, for example. Time, we tell a story about a princess. Uh, the story itself may last for two minutes, but the actual extent of the story goes on for a thousand years. And similarly, with identity, we all pretend to be monkeys in the jungle, okay, and that is our identity for now. And all the participants um, are colluding in that, are joining in that. And this um, is really important in creating this community feeling that is so important for learning in a classroom, the appropriate, effective atmosphere. And I think what I mentioned yesterday morning, Van Leer's lovely phrase of having everyone intersubjectively engaged. In other words, everyone focused um, in the same direction, which is very, very powerful. Okay, uh, my next point here, that they are social and communal, okay? They take place in real time, they are real events, and they also give us a context in which to develop those other skills that are so important when we're working with children, not just the English, skills of turn-taking, listening to each other, cooperating, collaborating, working together, that they give us an ideal framework to develop those kind of um, transversal skills um, that go across the curriculum in terms of developing our children, not just as English language speakers, but as um, good citizens um, as well. And my last, um, my last shared feature here, which helps us hugely with classroom management, by the way, they are governed by rules and conventions that both stories and drama have rules and conventions that children are often familiar with from their first language context. If they've been told stories at home, they know, although they can't articulate it, that stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. That the structure of stories, there is a state of equilibrium at the beginning that is disturbed and leads to certain kind of tensions and conflict, and at the end of the story, there is a resolution. There are also, of course, um, conventions to do with how we behave when we're listening to a story or participating in drama. The fact that during a story, we listen and are attentive and join in and participate as invited, and that in drama, we also, if other people are acting something out, we listen and watch, and we also um, turn take. So I think these rules and conventions are very important. Okay, so those then, if you like, are some kind of um, foundations for the links between story and drama, and why I believe that in our classrooms, they integrate and work so well together in leading the children to communicating in English and also being creative, even at a very low and young level. 
Now, I'm sure you're all thinking, how does this work in practice? Well, in fact, I've seen some lovely sessions during this conference, which shows that you're already working a lot in this area, and it's absolutely wonderful um, to see. So I've had a, a dilemma, what kind of story to do with you, and what I've chosen to do this morning is a story for our younger age groups, okay, so for sort of year one and low level, because actually the framework and the principles that I'm talking about work with stories, whatever age we're working with, actually, okay? And I think it's easier for us to see how we can up the levels, and indeed, while we're doing this, um, we can talk about that, than it is to see how we um, bring them down. So even if you're not working with year one, or you are working with year one, and you've got a fantastically advanced group of children, okay, I think that you'll still be able to see the relevance of what we're doing. Please also remember that it's very difficult for me to actually use an actual story that you have actually got in your schools and are using in your classrooms. But again, I think you will be able to see and think of stories in Malaysian culture, in the storybooks you've got, that could be adapted to um, a similar kind of approach. Okay, so what we're going to start off with then, and this is where there's no chance for sleep. We're going to do, we're actually going to do a story about a tiger in the jungle. And what we need to do, first of all, is to create the jungle in this room. And actually, the way we're going to do this is through a sound collage. So I would like you just now, you don't need your pens or anything like that, put them, put them down. I would just like you to close your eyes for a second. Don't fall asleep on me. <laughs> and just visualize in your heads, can you see the jungle. Yes. Can you see the jungle in your heads? I now want you to listen, listen to the sounds of the jungle. Maybe the pattering of rain, the cawing of birds, the splashing of the stream, the swishing of the grass and the leaves. In just a moment, I am going to ask you to make a sound that you hear in the jungle. And very importantly, I want you to make this sound loud enough so the people around you, at your table, for example, can hear your sound, but not so loud that you can't hear other people's sound. Okay, and then I want you to repeat your sound at regular intervals. Okay, you can open your eyes now if you haven't already. By the way, with a class of children, at least three quarters of them <coughs> never close their eyes in the first place. It doesn't really matter. And I want you to watch my hands because I'm going to be a conductor. That was a metaphor we didn't talk about. When I raise my hands, I want the jungle noise to become louder. And when I bring my hands down, it's going to become softer. So is everybody ready with their sound of the jungle? Yes. OK, so I'm going to count you in. One, two, three. And then this room is going to become the jungle. Are you ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Wonderful. OK, lovely. And do notice how in classroom management terms, the teacher can make it louder, 
then you're worried about the workshops next door, so you <laughs> bring it down and you can bring it to a complete halt. And what we can then do, we could actually choose two children. Would you like to come? Okay, don't worry, you're not going to have to do anything frightening. Okay, now these children are going to walk around the jungle. Okay, so obviously as they come near your table, the noise gets louder. And as they move away from your table, it fades again. So would you just walk a little bit round the jungle together, together, because you're scared. It's a bit scary. You have to be two in the jungle. Okay, ready with your noise? Off you go. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, lovely. Well done. Okay. Okay, so of course we could, we could follow up on that. We could ask the children, what do you hear in the jungle? I hear the rain, I hear the birds, I hear the grass, etc. Okay, that kind of activity, by the way, the secret of that activity is one, to keep it very short. If you've never done this kind of activity with your children before, introduce it softly, softly, okay? Keep it short um, and also make it clear that you take this very seriously, okay? Um, and actually what happens, and this, I, no guarantee, but it really does happen, that the majority of children want to create the jungle so if there are a few who are messing about, you find it's not you who has to do the classroom management, it's the children themselves who, who want to create that. Okay, so we've got our jungle, we've created our jungle with sounds. Now what we're going to do is we are going to go and find Tiger. Okay. So this is going to be a follow my leader activity and I would like everybody please to stand up, put your pens down, okay, <laughs> did I hear a groan there, <laughs> okay, everybody stand up and I would like you to be ready to follow me through the jungle to find Tiger, don't be scared, don't be scared. It's all right to follow me through the jungle. You don't need to actually move. All you need to do is to copy my movements on the spot. Is everybody ready for the jungle? Yes. I think you better put your hats on. I think you better put your boots on. And off we go. Let's walk very slowly and very carefully. And let's swish through the grass, looking for Tiger. Where's Tiger? Where's Tiger? On we go, slowly and carefully, under the branch of a tree, through the grasses, and here's a stream. We must jump over the stream. And look over there, it's Tiger. No, 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 don't worry, don't. Tiger, he's Sleeping. Tiger's sleeping. So we better creep back a little bit and sit down in our chairs. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Lovely. Right, okay. Mm. So what we're doing there then, an initial drama activity to create interest and attention, get some movement in the classroom, and think about also what's going on language-wise there. 
because actually what we're doing is exposing the children to quite rich language, language maybe they don't know, but they understand it because of the drama. A stream with water, we jump over the stream, okay. Note as teacher, although I'm at the front, I need eyes in the back of my head, okay, as well. I'm constantly looking around to make sure that everyone is with me. Okay, so Tiger is there. And he's... And he's... Oh, you're such a wonderful class. <laughs> he's dreaming. Oh, maybe. <laughs> Maybe sorry. Did I tell you about imagination? You, and you said that this is you with adults and the children will be off as well. Okay, if I tell you that he's dreaming about... <laughs> You're wonderful. No? He's dreaming about... Us. You can tell me in a minute. He's dreaming about other animals. What animals is he dreaming about, do you think? Crocodile. Yeah. Crocodile, crocodile. He, you're right. You're right. He is dreaming about a crocodile. A crocodile. Everyone. Crocodile. Lovely. Okay. So he is dreaming about a crocodile. What else is he dreaming about? Oh, very good. Okay. He is. He's dreaming about an Elephant. Elephant. Now, this may be vocabulary of the children. Know. It depends how you're going to set up the story. If it isn't vocabulary of the children, know, lots and lots of repetition practice. And if they shout it out in Malay, recast positively, but in English. You're right. An elephant. Elephant. Everybody. Elephant. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Well, you're very clever, and most children are now normally on to me, and they know my flashcards are going, looking. What else is he dreaming about? Lion. 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 That's a very good idea, but no. <laughs> a monkey. A monkey. You're right. He's dreaming about a monkey. Okay, a monkey. And a snake. <laughs> This table is on to me, you know, they can see my flashcards. Okay, <laughs> there's always one group, like, it doesn't matter, it's, good. it's great, actually, you know, the important thing is that they're really interested in seeing my flashcards, that's what I mind about. Okay, so, a snake, a snake, okay, a snake. What else? A deer, that's a very good idea as well, but no. A mouse, okay. He's dreaming about a mouse. A mouse. Actually, we'll put the mouse here. Okay. Giraffe. Very good. Okay. Giraffe. And a? Yeah, I was just going to show you, actually, just two simple ways. This is not rocket science. But one thing you might want to do with your children uh, is one of these kind of activities. Okay, so you ask what's he dreaming about and you just go. <laughs> or you do. Very good. Okay, parrot. Or another way you can do it, this one. Uh, this way is called slowly, slowly. Can you tell me the animal? This is amazing prediction skills. I'm, re I'm really impressed. Okay. Frog. Yes, you're right. Okay. So, a frog, a parrot, and frog. Okay, so we don't have time to do a lot of flashcard activities and games. But if this was new vocabulary for your children, you would want to do a lot of quick, ludic, playful, activities to help the children recognize the vocabulary and also produce it. Actually, if you're interested in flashcard games, on my website, I've got a little document with 30 flashcard games. You can go and download that if you want some flashcard games. We might also at this point, but in this 
session, I'm not focusing on reading and writing, but we would want to integrate it. We would also do games with um, word cards, okay, kind of matching, that kind of thing. Let's just have an example of the kind of game that we might play and actually see how this also helps children learn. Mm. This one is called Magic Eyes. Okay, are you ready to do this? And this, all you have to do, I'm a bit hot, so my fingers aren't clicking very much. So I'd like you just to click your fingers or clap. Okay, and it's going to be like a little chant. So I'm going to go, just hang on a sec. I'm going to go, crocodile, monkey, elephant, snake, mouse, giraffe, parrot, frog. Get your fingers going. Everyone ready? Crocodile, elephant, monkey, snake, mouse, giraffe, parrot, frog. I think you're so advanced that we can do this really quickly. Okay, everybody ready? Crocodile, elephant, monkey, snake, mouse, giraffe, parrot, frog. Ah, are you ready? Crocodile, elephant, monkey, snake, mouse, giraffe, parrot, frog. You're fantastic. No two ways about it. Ready? Again? Then I say to my children, I think that's enough. <laughs> you can't do any more. And they go, yes, we can, yes, we can. Okay, that's, that's how my children go. I'm not expecting you to go like that, but we'll, we'll just take this to the bitter end. Okay, so are we ready? Yes. Get those fingers going. Fantastic. Is that enough? Should we go on? No. <laughs> Are we ready? Get those fingers going. Amazing. I don't think you can do this though. Etc. Etc. Come on. Okay. We've got to do it to the end now. You can't do this. You'll never be able to do it. Okay, and this is where my children go, yes, we can. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, ready? Woohoo! Well done. Fantastic. Okay, let's just think a little bit about what we're doing with a very simple technique like that. We are getting an endless amount of repetition practice. I could, as teachers, stand at the front of the class and say, okay, everybody, repeat after me. Show the flashcard, elephant, monkey, da 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 da. The children will be bored as anything and they will be distracted. But what we're doing here, we're making it rhythmical. Remember, musical intelligence. We're making it, um, it's visual, okay, visual memory. We're helping the children to develop visual memory. It's auditory through the chant. So actually what we're doing, the children are visualizing the pictures. They're associating them with the auditory. And there is also the cognitive challenge of memorizing so we're developing that kind of skill as well. So little activities like this, you know, by themselves, you may, that's just a little activity. But when we put it all together with other things that make that kind of sense, it amounts to a huge difference um, in, our, in our teaching. Okay, so fantastic. So where have we got to? Tiger is dreaming about all these animals. Okay, and um, actually here he is. Okay, can you see the animals? Can you spot them there? Yeah. Okay, okay. So we could actually do um, a little activity with the children, first of all, to give them recognition practice. I might say the names of the animals, they say the numbers, that's familiar, if they didn't know this vocabulary. 
Uh, but we'll just do it the other way. So I'll just say the numbers. Could you just call out the names of the animals? Okay, so seven. Crocodile. Uh, five. Giraffe. Four. Monkey. Okay, we don't need to do the whole lot. Okay. <laughs> Okay, but what we will do now is a little um, chant, okay, a little chant with um, Tiger. Where is my Tiger? Oh, here he is. Okay, so here, okay, we might get half the cloud. Let's divide us um, into this side of the room. Okay, you're going to be Tiger. This side of the room, um, you're going to, uh, you're going to ask the question, okay. So your tiger, you may have your, I saw this in a, one of the sessions I've been to at the conference, a teacher very sensibly said, actually if you have things like masks, it's much better to have them round your neck so that you can still see the children's faces and that they're participating, they're not completely hiding. Okay, so um, this little chant goes very, very simply. Um, Tiger, tiger, listen to me. Name the animals you can see. Number one. It's a... Okay? Couldn't be easier. We're going to do it with some rhythm, okay? And you can also... I won't ask you to stand up at this point, um, but you can, you know, dance away in your chairs if you're in the mood. Okay. So, are we ready then? This group's starting off. Oh, and you're a tiger. Did I say you were a tiger? Oh, I said, okay, classic teacher mistake. Okay. But children love it when you make it. They love to be able to correct it. Okay, so, so we start off. We go, tiger, tiger, listen to me. Name the animals you can see. Okay, number one, it's a... Okay, off we go. Is my audio man there? Abracadabra. Is he there? Abracadabra, the audio. Is he there? Yeah. Oh, he's there. Oh, good. Just in case anything goes wrong. <laughs> Ready, guys? Are you going to stay there? Yeah. <laughs> Go, tiger, listen to me. Name the animals you can see. Number one. Come on, you've got to join in after all this technology stuff. <laughs> Two. It's a snake. Number three. It's an elephant. Number four. It's a monkey. Number five. It's a giraffe. Okay, that's it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Our technological hero there. Okay, fantastic. I'd just like to say um, that, you know, I know you don't have this actual chant in your classroom, but you can actually, you can just do a lot. You know, if you have a tambourine or a maracas, you can get the rhythm going. So you don't, don't think, oh, no, I can't do that because I don't have that actual chant. Actually, you can do it. And as we saw um, before... Our techno man very kindly helped me out. We can do it. Okay, so there's Tiger. He's sleeping. He's dreaming about the animals. What happens in the story, do you think? What happens? He woke up. He woke up. No. He's hungry. So maybe he's going to eat all the animals. No idea. Okay. 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 Any other ideas? Come for his birthday party. A birthday party. How <laughs> wonderful. Okay. 
I sense an ELT writer here in the room. That would be a lovely story. OK, just an important point here. What we're doing is getting the children's predictions because we are creating interest in the story. But I don't know about your year one learners, but mine certainly would not be able to respond to that question in English. OK, so this would be a moment, and I think it's a legitimate moment with these young children. And you have the wonderful advantage that you speak the children's first language. Very often I'm working with, for example, British Council teachers in British Council centres who've been sent all over the world and don't necessarily have that advantage. So they can't do that. So you can ask them what happens. Very important, you don't speak the children's first language yourself. You listen to what they say. OK, um, you know, Tiger's hungry, he's going to eat the animals. And you recast back using simple key words maybe that the children know. What a good idea. Tiger's hungry. He's going to eat the animals for lunch. Maybe. Very good. OK, so you don't use the children. Because if you start using the children's L1, they will know that you're going to use it, and you will find yourself using it more, and it, it will increase. OK. And so this is, a, this is a moment. And sometimes what I do is I actually make a parenthesis with my voice. You know, I ask them, what happens in the story? And the children know this is a key. They can say in Spanish, in my case, the children. And they say very quickly. And I say, yes, I accept all these ideas. And then what it means is the children are really, really keen to hear the story. Because as we all know, not only children, adults too, we all want to know if we're right, OK, about the story. So what we're going to do now is we are going to um, listen to the story, OK? We're going to, we're going to listen to the story now. And um, what I'm going to ask you to do with the story, um, I don't want you to pretend you're children, but you may find yourself just joining in anyway. Um, but I, what I want you